All righty. It is uh, 6 02. So we are going to go ahead and get started. Uh, we have lots, lots to go over today. Um, let me just get my video, shall we? All right. Uh, well, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Alex Durr, um, and I want to welcome you all to uh, Navigating in the Mountains an introduction to route finding in the Rockies. Um, thanks, uh, first of all, for everyone um, being patient. I had to reschedule this from last week um, after I came down. Uh, with a, a bug, but I am doing much better now and, and really excited to dig in. Um, just to say again, if anybody does have any questions during today's session, go ahead and post those in the Q&A box here on the screen. Um, I, I see people have already started commenting in there. Um, we'll try to get to all of those points during uh, or at the end of today's session. Before we dig in, I want to start by just doing a quick poll for the group to try to gauge where we're at in terms of our um, skill and experience in this area. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and quick launch that. You should see it on the screen now. And it's just asking, what is your experience level using a map and compass to navigate? Um, you know, whether you have no experience at all, just a little, moderate level, uh, or you think you're very experienced. Um, that'll help me, um, you know, target today's session at the right level. Uh, so I see people are answering right now. We'll just give you a few more seconds to to answer that question. Alrighty, um, then I'm going to go ahead and oh, one more answer, it looks like. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and publish this. All right, so uh, it looks like by far the biggest group here is a little experience with 52%, followed by no experience with 33%, and about 15% of you have either moderate or a lot of experience. So um, that's good. That's, that's what I was sort of expecting today uh, in terms of experience level. Um, and so uh, I think the content here today will be exactly what uh, what you're all looking for. So um, you should see on the screen here um, the slideshow that I'm going to be using today, uh, navigating the mountains. Um, if you can't see that, um, go ahead and let me know in the, the message chat, but uh, we should be good to go. Uh, so to introduce myself, uh, my name is Alex Durr. Um, I've got 45 uh, plus probably no, now more like 55 plus ascents um, above 13,000 feet here in Colorado, California, and a few other states. Um, and I've been doing this my whole life. Um, you know, I grew up in the scouting program. Um, I remember using a, a compass on an orienteering course when I was, you know, 10 years old and hating it. Um, but little did I know these skills would come back and, and be hugely uh, valuable, valuable to me uh, today. I'm also a Leave No Trace uh, trainer, and I'm Wilderness First Aid certified, uh, which is why I really try to take a focus on on both LNT and and mountain safety uh, in everything I do. But really, what brings me here today is is that I'm passionate about you know helping people get outside uh, and explore the mountains safely and responsibly. Um, you know, navigation is a, a huge uh, a piece of, of staying safe in the mountain. Um, you know, it, it involves really just staying on route and staying where you want to be. So that's what we're going to be focusing on today. Uh, on that topic specifically, you know, I wanted to define this because uh, navigation really includes a lot. But um, according to uh, the, uh, uh, let me get the name right, um, NALS, which is the uh, one of the biggest uh, training programs out, out there for wilderness education, uh, they define navigation as accurately ascertaining one's position and planning and following a route. And so those are really the big pieces we're going to be looking at today, you know, is, is one planning out your route in advance, because I think a lot of people don't um, don't do that enough and don't really consider it an aspect of navigation. And then we'll also be talking about, you know, how to ascertain your position and then based on that, how to follow the route that you plan. As a as an added benefit, we'll also cover what to do if you get lost, because, of course, that's sort of the the worst case scenario we're trying to prevent. Uh, but we also want to leave you prepared in case that should happen. So to dig in, uh, part one, we're going to talk about the gears you, the gear uh, and tools that you need to navigate, uh, specifically uh, maps, uh, compasses, and GPS tools. So uh, this will be sort of the foundation for today's work. Um, topographic maps are really the the foundation for good navigation in the mountains, um, and it's. It, I want to be specific that. These are topographic maps. Uh, there are a lot of maps in the world. You know, there are maps meant for driving. Um, there are maps like something on Google Maps um, or Yelp that simply shows you where you know a destination is. Um, 
none of these maps are, are really good tools when it comes to hiking. Um, a lot of people will go to a national park or to a state park and they'll get sort of the like very basic state park map that just shows, you know, the location of different trails and the location of different buildings. And again, these just don't have the information you need to be able to navigate. And, and the big thing they're missing here is topography, um, the contour lines. This, this is an example here on the screen of a topographic map, which essentially means it shows you not only things like, you know, uh, where there's forest or where there's a trail, it actually shows you the shape of the land and the elevation. Um, and this is sort of the, you know, the, the break make or break thing that really allows you to navigate using a map and, and, and route find and locate your position without any other tools. Um, so a topographic map is really essential if you're going to be in the mountains. Um, the USGS, uh, that's the um, United States Geological Survey, uh, they are sort of the gold standard uh, for using topographic maps. Uh, you can find them on their website. Um, the biggest thing you want to be mindful of with these, uh, with all topographic maps, is is where you're getting it from, uh, who the source is, and when the map was created, uh, because there are a lot of outdated, incomplete, or simply inaccurate maps out there. Um, so whenever possible, use a, a good source, like the USGS. Uh, in terms of where to get a good map specifically, um, I I really recommend getting uh, not something you just print out yourself, but actually buying a professional waterproof and rip proof map. Uh, these are my favorites. You can buy them at REI or at most major outdoor suppliers, uh, but they're just far more long lasting than something you print out yourself. Uh, obviously things get wet when you're outside, things can get stuck in the rain or fall into a creek. Uh, and so having a, something waterproof uh, and also rip proof means it's probably going to last you a long longer um, and it'll be there when you need it. Um, if you'd like, you can also just print your own maps off online. Uh, Topo Zone is a, a website that has a lot of different maps um, and you can order maps or download them directly from the USGS. Um, this link here, which I'll include emailed out to you after this session today, um, it allows you to locate the right map that you want to buy. And then from there, you can either download a PDF uh, or buy a, a more sturdy copy um, to have sent to you. So. Definitely my recommendation for, for getting really high quality uh, detailed maps. The next tool we're gonna talk about is a compass. Um, and a lot of people don't really see this as necessary on a mountain, especially in a world where every phone has a built-in you know, uh, map, uh, GPS app. Uh, this is, I think, the, the thing that gets left behind the most. Um, and in most cases, you frankly don't need a compass. Um, in 95% of situations, um, you shouldn't need a GPS or compass. Um, you can really get by just navigating with a map uh, and some skills that we'll go through. However, a compass makes all the difference uh, when you can't navigate by sight alone. You know, when you're not able to like just look out, see what's on the map, look out in the terrain and make connections. Um, for example, uh, if you're hiking a 14er in September and a snowstorm moves in and you're suddenly dealing with whiteout conditions uh, that obscures the path, um, this is a situation where a compass and taking a compass bearing might be very valuable. Similarly, if you get stuck outdoors overnight uh, and you're unlucky enough to not have much moonlight, uh, you might need a compass. Uh, and then third, of course, fog and cloud cover can happen on a 14er uh, or a 13er any time of year uh, and any weather conditions. So there are a lot of situations and I've been in many of them myself just in the past few years where a compass made all the difference. So you may bring a compass and only end up using it one in every 10 trips, uh, but I still recommend bringing it and I recommend practicing with it beforehand so that if and when the time comes, you know, you're prepared and you know what to do with it. When you're picking out a compass, uh, Couple things to keep in mind. First, make sure you get a compass that is designed for North America. This matters because uh, you know magnetic north varies a lot, uh, and specifically if you're looking at the southern hemisphere, you know things get really weird. Um, so compasses are actually designed for different continents differently um, in order to be more or less accurate. So if you get a compass designed to work in Russia, there's a good chance it's not going to be accurate if you're in North America. You also want to get a compass that is designed with hiking and with orienteering in mind. You might see a lot of, you know, old rustic looking compasses on Instagram that are, you know, just a little circular case. Um, these are not nearly as helpful because they lack this, this base plate, which is this clear plastic part here. 
uh, and some of these markings and other tools, the, the movable um, dial around the compass head here um, that is very helpful for orienting, those are, are features you really do need. So if you just have a simple circle compass that doesn't have a base plane and doesn't have a turn style, you may wanna upgrade uh, because that's gonna make a lot of difference. Um, lastly, if you think to yourself, I've already got a, a GPS or I've got a phone and it can always point out which way is north. Um, it's important to remember that a GPS and a compass do two different things. A GPS doesn't take bearings as easily as a compass does. Uh, and it also doesn't overlay onto a map in the same way. So a GPS is not a replacement. A phone is not a replacement for a compass. Um, always, always keep both on you. And third here, we have uh, sort of the suite of GPS tools and apps that have popped up over the last 20 years. Um, the simplest option is just you know an app that you can download on your smartphone. Um, Gaia and All Trails are two popular examples that I, I hear about a lot. Um, however, the downside of these is that they're relying on your phone, right, as like the core technology. And phones are fragile, and their their batteries die pretty quickly in in the mountains. Uh, so if you, if you are going to be using GPS a lot, I do recommend getting something more dependable. Uh, for example, Garmin sells a series of in-reach devices uh, that are very robust. They don't require any kind of cell phone signal. Uh, they're pretty dependable, uh, tough, uh, and their battery life is going to last three, four, five days, whereas you're lucky if you can keep your cell phone on for two. So definitely recommend a GPS unit rather than just a, a simple app. A few factors though to keep in mind with GPS, um, you know, GPS is, is a tool uh, to add to your toolbox. It isn't a replacement for everything in your toolbox, right? Um, this is not a, a get out of having to navigate free card, so to speak. Uh, in fact, there are studies that show people who rely pretty exclusively on a GPS to navigate will never get good with a map and compass. They actually lose their ability to navigate intuitively over time, sort of because the GPS is serving as a crutch, right? Um, they never have to locate the, their position or or locate all their terrain features. Um, so I recommend really building up your skill with a map first, um, then a compass, and only buying a GPS once you've got enough experience that you're not worried about becoming overly reliant. Um, a lot of people rush out and buy a GPS first, and they never get the map skills they need, which means the moment that GPS fails on them, they have no backup plan uh, to get themselves out of trouble. So. Always, always remember GPS is more of a backup plan than it is a, a primary method of navigation. All right, so those that's a quick rundown on, on the tools and equipment you're gonna need. Now we're gonna actually dig into route planning and then kind of talk through how you might navigate, uh, find your position, orient uh, using these various tools. So planning your route in advance is important. Um, if you have been showing up to a trailhead, sort of, without any preparation whatsoever just you know knowing where the trailhead is and where the mountain is um that's where you can grow first i would say um so picking a route should start by considering your objective you know where you want to end up uh and how you need to get there um, the biggest probably most important question to ask is is whether you plan to travel on trail or off trail um most people uh, will will stick to a trail, which is a good idea. It's obviously easier to navigate and follow a route if you've got a, a clear trail to follow uh, from the trailhead all the way to your final destination. Um, however, a lot of, of peaks, for example, especially 13ers and, and 12ers and, and some more um, uh, less common, commonly climbed peaks, um, they have no trail, uh, either for part of the route or for all of the route. Um, and there are even a few 14ers, for example, uh, Calabra Peak is the privately owned 14er um, down in the Sangres. Uh, there is, is little to no trail to follow uh, on the Calabra route. So these are places where, you know, you're going to need to do a little bit more planning and thinking uh, than if you were just following the trail. Another thing to consider is, is whether to follow a standard route on a 14er or 13er or whether you want to attempt a non-standard route. Um, these usually are less traveled, which means there's less people to follow. The trails are usually less defined. Uh, and some non-standard routes really don't have a trail. It really is a route in the sense that it is, you know, a string of landmarks or a string of destinations. Uh, and you're just going from one to the other. 
uh, following the the path of least resistance, you know, to get from one to the next. So that is that is the hardest way to navigate. Uh, and the more uh, the more rugged the peaks you are, uh, and the more solitude, um, you know, wilderness sort of areas you're going to, the more off trail travel you're going to do. Um, so in this case, if you are doing an off trail route you're gonna to have to sit down and really figure out what are landmarks along the way. Uh, for example, lakes or trails, rivers, ridges, structures, um, tree line, and use these landmarks um, to string together a route to reach your destination. If you are on trail, thankfully, you really just have to have a good idea of where that trail leads uh, before you get there. So once you've got a rough idea of your on or off trail route, um, you can do a lot of your research. And, and a lot of these should hopefully should be sort of obvious reminders that people are already doing, but just in case you aren't, uh, you wanna always read through a full description of the route, uh, whether it's on a trail or off a trail, you'll usually be able to find some descriptions from other people uh, about what they came up to, what their, what their biggest uh, landmarks were that they were following, uh, and that can be hugely, hugely beneficial. You also want to look at the topographic map yourself and and already begin identifying what the major landmarks are going to be. So you know, again, are there lakes along the way that you'll stop at? Are there big peaks that are going to come into view um, or that you will leave? Are you going any, over any big ridges or over any saddles? You know, all of these things are going to help you navigate when you're out in the field. Uh, if there are photos of the route, if if someone else has posted a trip report, for example, uh, these can be very helpful uh, by helping you begin to do some terrain association, um, which means essentially, you know, imagining what's on the map and imagining what that's going to actually look like, what the terrain is going to look like uh, visually in real life. Um, so doing a little bit about uh, of that before you actually get out there is, is again, very, uh, very helpful because it gives you an idea of what to expect. Um, a map is 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 you know, a very simple two-dimensional model of what, what's out there, um, the more you can start creating an, uh, an actual picture in your mind's eye of, of what the terrain will look like itself, the better off you'll be. Uh, someone who, I'll just finish by saying, someone who is a very experienced navigator should be able to look at a map, a topographic map of the route, and just based on reading that, they should be able to give you a very detailed description of what the terrain is going to be like, you know, the various... Um, eco zones that you'll be passing through, where there are going to be opportunities for water, uh, as well as good campsites along the way, um, and what you should see at various points. Um, you know, how steep the route will be at various segments. All of these things can be predicted with a very high degree of accuracy just by reviewing the map uh, in advance. And that's what we're going to dig into here next. Um, the last step for, for researching uh, your route in advance uh, I really recommend this, is to create a trip plan, uh, which is essentially a detailed overview of your itinerary, the route you want to take, any campsites you'll be stopping at, uh, backup or alternative plans if something you know goes wrong along the way, the gear you're going to need, uh, etc. And there are three big main benefits to creating a travel plan or a trip plan. Um, first, this is going to force you to practice these map reading skills. Uh, you know, to sit down with a map and actually chart out the route and again, see where the best campsites are, uh, where there are flat areas along the trail that you could camp at, um, where there are water checkpoints where you'll be able to refill your water, um, what kind of gear you're going to need based on the kind of terrain you're moving over. Um, it just forces you to learn these things. It's also going to serve as a tool to help you monitor your progress. Uh, so throughout, you know, the trip, you can see if you're falling behind. Uh, and third, if you leave a copy at home, it's a really great resource for them to use, you know, if you go missing or if you're late, uh, because they'll have an idea of where you could be very specifically. All right, uh, part three, we're finally now going to get into the nuts and bolts of navigation itself. Uh, first, using a map alone. Uh, I think it's it's really important to say that if you're doing this right and you've practiced a lot, 95% of the time, you should be able to go out there on a 14er or in the mountains and do a really good job of staying on route and navigating and finding your position and never have to pull out a compass and never have to pull out a GPS unit. Um, really, with the strong map navigation skills, you can do almost everything you need to do. So to begin, a few common map features that everyone should know. Um, like I said, contour lines are important because they let us uh, see elevation and sort of read the terrain. 
uh, and we'll, we'll look at that on the next slide. Uh, but some of these other common features that are on, on most maps uh, include things like highways, roads, and trails. Um, typically, these are going to be uh, trails or dotted lines, roads or solid lines, and, and then a highway is a very thick solid line. We also have lakes and streams, uh, creeks, other bodies of water, which are going to be marked in blue, uh, either as a line, a dotted line, or as a, a circle. And then we've got towns uh, and structures, residences, uh, which are, are drawn as boxes. Uh, residences are usually, uh, or residential areas are usually uh, yellow. And then lastly, there's a lot of named landmarks. So if there's major peaks, uh, major ridges, uh, old town locations, um, these may also be marked on the map as well. However, the most important thing uh, really comes down to these contour lines because they allow us uh, to, to engage in a really crucial skill, probably the most important navigation skill there is, which is called terrain association. Um, it's, it's really critical and makes or breaks uh, the usefulness of a map. So really, in a nutshell, a terrain association is the ability to read a map and create an image in your mind of what the associated terrain looks like in real life. And then as well, it's the opposite, right? It's, it's the ability to look out at the terrain and imagine in your mind's eye, what should the map look like? You know, based on where I'm looking out and what I see up uh, in front of me, where should I be on this map, essentially? Uh, and as you can see, this, this is a hugely helpful skill because if you're able to uh, read a map and look out and essentially imagine it ahead of you, you're going to be able to navigate much more easily. You're going to be able to, so to speak, see the route ahead of you and just intuitively know, okay, well, on the map, it looks like we should be going this way. And looking out, I know that north is this direction, so we should be going this way. It, it often never gets to the point of even needing a compass. So if you're new to, to this skill of terrain association, um, the hardest part is really going to be understanding these contour lines and, and sort of uh, translating them from these two-dimensional lines and circles into three-dimensional landforms. And here's a good example on this slide of that in practice. Um, you can see in this case, we have a series of these circles, um, smaller and smaller concentric circles, um, which end here in the smallest circle. And that really signifies the shape of a mountain. The thing to remember with contour lines is that each line, every spot on this line is at equal elevation. So if I was walking a line along one of these lines, I would essentially be walking along the side of this hill without going up or down at all. Um, you're, you're really following the shape of the land. Um, that's, that is the key thing to remember uh, you know, when, uh, when looking at these. And that means if I move up from one line to the next, that means I'm moving uphill, you know, if I'm going up towards the center of the circles. And likewise, if I'm heading down away from these centers, that means I'm going downhill. Uh, this also means that when these little lines, as you can see right here, as they get closer together, that means the, uh, the elevation is getting steeper, right? To the point that if you see a lot of these lines stacked up on, on top of each other, and so it almost looks like just you know, a very thick line, uh, that's actually going to be a cliff because it's it's showing you that, you know, uh, this cliff is at multiple elevations, right? The same spot on a cliff can cover 200 feet. And so you might see 200 feet worth of contour lines all in one spot. So whenever you see a really, really dark line or a lot of contour lines converging, it means you're looking at a cliff. These are These are things you know, that it, that can be very helpful when you're out on the trail, right? And you, and you see that on a map ahead of you. Oh, I'm heading straight towards these, big, you know, big dark line. I need to go around that. And so here are some common patterns you're going to see uh, in topography. Um, the nice thing about mountains is that they really do follow a, a consistent pattern of, you know, having summits and peaks, ridges and drainages usually the ridges and the drainages or valleys as you could call them uh, alternate you've got a ridge and a valley and a ridge and a valley um, and then at the head of all of this of course we have a summit uh, and sometimes between summits you might have a saddle uh, but those are really the main landforms and if you can understand how to read these four things on a topographical map and then look around you you should be able to pretty quickly you know draw some connections between what you're seeing in real life and what you're seeing on the map 
So I'll do each of these one by one. Um, the first is, is an example like we just saw, a summit or a peak. Um, these show up uh, on a map as a, a series of concentric circles. And the very smallest circle at the top within that circle is going to be the peak. A ridge is going to show up as a series of, of V or U-shaped lines, kind of like this, you know, moving gradually down the ridge. Uh, and whichever uh, direction that the point points, that's going to be pointing down the ridge, uh, since each of those lines represents a losing of elevation. A drainage, which can be, you know, anything from a broad valley uh, to a, a, a steep canyon, uh, but anything that is collecting water downhill, uh, these sort of look like a uh, an inverse of a ridge. Uh, again, they're going to be pointed sort of more V-shaped lines, but this time that arrow is going to be pointing down the drainage. Um, usually these ridges and these drainages will alternate on a map, so you'll see a ridge and then you'll see a drain next to it. And then lastly, we have saddles. Uh, this is essentially a low point on a ridge that forms between two peaks, and so the contours for a saddle are going to form what looks like an hourglass uh, shape between them. So let's look at an actual map to see some examples of these in real life. Um, if anybody here is a 14er fan, you should recognize Long's Peak here in Rocky Mountain National Park. I thought I would use this as a fun example. So here we've got uh, Mount Meeker is, is a, a mountain right next to Long's Peak. You can see we've got the series of concentric circles here that get smaller and smaller. And the smallest circle right here on the top is going to point out where the actual, you know, top of the mountain is, right around 13, uh, 138 or 13900. Um, similarly, right next to it uh, is a saddle. And this this one, you can kind of, it almost looks like an X, but you can see this hourglass shape, right, where it's, it's thicker on the top and the bottom and thinner in the middle. Um, and the lack of any contour lines within it shows us that this is a very flat saddle, right? Because within all of this terrain, it never changes by more than you know 50 feet in elevation, which is not much for the mountains. Up here, um, uh, we've got a pretty good example of some cliffs. You can see here on this side of this, this point, you know, the lines are pretty well spaced out. But on this side, they get so close together that you can barely you know, see, see the uh, space between them. Uh, which means it's a sudden drop off in elevation. So if I was coming up here, I would definitely not want to continue over this ridge uh, because of the cliffs here. And then over here on the right, we've got some good examples of some alternating uh, ridges and drainages. You know, here again, you can see the pretty telltale sign of a ridge because you're seeing these these pointed uh, V's kind of coming down from a peak, uh, coming down this way. And then even here, you see it splits into two ridges. So this one ridge heads off north here, and another ridge heads off uh, to the east. Similarly, we have a drainage here in the bottom right. Um, this drainage is is just starting out. It literally forms right here. So it's very slight. You know, you can see these Vs are not nearly as dramatic as, as the ridge up here. However, the nice telltale sign for a drainage is that almost always there's going to be a creek or river of some kind going down it. So both on this drainage, we can see Cabin Creek runs down it. And up here is another a uh, broader drainage. Um, it's actually a glacial valley here uh, with big, large U shapes. Once again, this also has a river, uh, the Roaring Fork, um, heading down down this one. So, um, as you can see, really understanding just ridges and drainages and sal um, saddles and peaks can help you really understand what the main landforms here are. You know, we've got a big mountain here, obviously, uh, Mount Meeker and a big one here as well, uh, Long's Peak. And from each of these mountains, it's just going to be a series of drainages, you know, one large one here, another one to the east, one to the south, one to the west, punctuated with a series of ridges that kind of shoot out from the mountains. And this is what most mountain terrain in Colorado uh, and in most of the mountain west looks like. So uh, hopefully this gives you a, a sort of a, a crash course in understanding you know, what to look for on the map in terms of lines uh, and what that should look like in real life. Um, while I'm on this page, does anyone have any other questions about contour lines um, and how they show up on a map uh, versus real life? Um, if you do, feel free to post that in the, the Q&A box and we will keep moving them.
So when it comes to terrain association, I want to be clear. Um, oh, actually, someone just asked, can I show a gully on the map? I should be able to find one on here. So a, a key thing to note about these maps is that you know different types of maps show a different level of detail. Um, the USGS maps are, are nice and close up. This map I got online is not as close up. So a USGS map is going to show you, for example, smaller gullies that may be too small to appear on a larger map, um, which is one reason why you want to get as, as detailed of a, a topographical map as you can. It's going to show you cliffs and gullies and things that might not show up normally. Um, a gully on this map, though, any if you if you look right here, right to the north of Mount Meeker, you can see these little V's, right? Um, that kind of form up this this little divot almost in the mountain. That's going to be a big gully on the north side of this mountain. So if you're an ice climber um, or a, a snow climber climbing uh, Kotlars in the in the spring, you know you might shoot straight up this gap um, to get out Mount Meeker. Um, similarly, there's a few famous gullies here on the on the face of Long's Peak, and anywhere you can see one of these very slight v shapes forming down the face you, you almost again you it's it's not nearly as as obvious as this massive drainage but wherever you see one of these little v shapes on the face of the mountain you're going to see it that's that's a gully so for example this right here this is actually the the loft route uh you take to climb long's peak via the loft which is this large saddle right here um someone else asked um how do you know where north is on the map Great question. Um, we'll we'll go through this in depth here in a moment, but in general, pretty much all maps are designed so that north is facing up uh, towards the top of the map. Um, so this map, I can guarantee, just because I, I found it and, and know it well, this area that north is going to be up, south is going to be down, uh, west is going to be left, and east is going to be to the right. So typically, you can just remember north is up. And unless you got a map from someone who has no business designing maps, um, north should be up on the map always. All righty. Big thing to remember here is that terrain association is not automatic. It's not something necessarily you're born with. And frankly, as people have been relying more and more and more on GPS to navigate, even when driving around, you know, just for for daily uh, daily chores and the like. People have been getting worse at this skill, not better. So it does take practice. Um, two methods I have for doing this while you're out in the field um, and, and growing these skills. Uh, first of all, uh, when you're hiking, uh, take some time to review the map. Uh, whenever you're going to come over a ridge, enter a new basin, um, come out of the trees and get a new vantage point, before you see that vantage point, uh, pause, look over your map. And, and discuss with your friends or anyone in your group what you should expect to see. You know, have that conversation about, okay, well, I'm looking on the map and I see two peaks ahead of us. So there should be two large mountains directly ahead of us. And I see this big ridge coming down on the right. And I see maybe some gullies heading up to the left. Um, that might be all you, you say. And come around the corner. And then actually, of course, see what it looks like and, and do some comparison of, you know, what you got right and what you got wrong. If you do this, you know, a few times every hiking trip, uh, you're going to notice yourself getting better and better and starting to catch more and more fine details on the map that you might have missed before. The other uh, good practice technique here is sort of the opposite. Um, go to a high point, you know, so if you're climbing a 14 or already, um, this is a great way to spend 30 minutes at the top. Um, you know, go up there and take a take a pad of paper with you and try to draw a topographic map of the area you see. You know, if you look out over a, a beautiful basin, just start kind of drawing out the ridges using, you know, contour lines. Draw circles around some of the big peaks, fill in some of the gullies and some of the drainages around you, draw in some creeks, maybe even like the tree line and such. And then again, look up the real map and see how close you got. Um, because again, if you do this over and over, you're going to get better and better and better uh, over time. So orienting your map. Um, this is um, to uh, the person's point who just asked. Uh, this is essentially orienting is, is, is a fancy word for figuring out which way is north, south, east, and west. Uh, and that's important to do when you're looking at a map, right? Because if you're going to 
you know, look, look on the map and see that it looks like it's that way. You need to make sure that you're actually looking at the map, you know, in line with the real cardinal direction so that you know it truly is that direction. Um, there are four ways that you can orient your map without using a compass. The first and easiest is to use landmarks. So for example, if there is only one lake in this basin and I can look directly ahead of me, you know, on the trail and I see the lake, and then I look on the map and I see where I am on the trail and I see the lake, you should be able to just use, you know, some common sense to figure out, you know, all right, well, if North is past the lake, you know, in real life, and here on the map, it's over here. You can just quickly align those using those those physical landmarks. Um, however, that's not always possible. Uh, for one thing, you might not know your own location. Um, the visibility might be bad. You might not be able to draw some clear conclusions about landmarks. And so in that case, uh, you want to use some of the, the more natural settings we have. Um, the biggest options are first, you can use the rising sun, you know, that rises in the east. So just watch which direction that is, and you immediately know which direction east is, and you can line your map up accordingly. Uh, you can do the opposite when the sun begins to set. It'll set to the west, and you can do that analysis. Uh, and then third, or, or fourth, you can, you can find the um, north star at nighttime. Um, I have a nice little diagram here on how to find the north star, because I get asked all the time how to do this. <laughs> Uh, and it's pretty simple uh, because thankfully the North Star uh, is is very close to two large uh, uh, constellations, you know, that people are very aware of. So um, the biggest thing to look for is the Big Dipper, which is going to be very close to the horizon. Uh, and then connect the two stars that form the right side of the cup in a line and extend that line out. And it'll point right to the North Star, uh, which, to be clear, will not be the brightest star. Uh, however, it is the star that everything else turns around. It it stays in the same location. Uh, and if you draw a line between the North Star and the ground, that's going to be north within a degree or two. So um, that is a great way to uh, orient your map um, if you're stuck outside at night. Last big thing we're going to talk about with a map is fixing your position, which is a fancy way to say finding where you are on the map. Uh, and we do this do using what's called a line of position. Um, a, a line of position is really just, it's an imaginary line that you can guarantee you are on somewhere. So essentially using these lines and creating these lines reduces uncertainty by telling you all the places you for sure are not and reducing it to a few, few options, right? So for example, if you're hiking down a trail in a forest and you you know you were expecting to come across a river but you haven't for a long time and you get confused and you pull out your map the first thing you can be certain of is that you're somewhere on that trail right as long as you look around and you see that you're on the trail still you know you haven't lost it um, you automatically can cross off from the list all the places on the map that aren't directly along that trail now, the power of a, a line of position comes when you're able to create two of them that cross, right? Because essentially what this is going to do is pinpoint your exact location. Uh, if you're somewhere on this line and you're able to put another line across it, you now know that you're at the only point where those two lines intersect. Uh, and this is called a position fix. And so when people are trying to uh, fix their position, that's the goal is to create two lines of position that intersect which will tell you where you are. And there's a couple of different ways we can do this. Uh, let's see here. So first of all, there's the most obvious and easy way, which is by using pre-existing lines of position. So uh, as an example, like I just said, if you know you're on a trail, you already know that you're somewhere along that line on the map. Um, but that extends to other examples too. Like if you're hiking up a ridge, you know, it's very obvious whether or not you are still on the ridge, right? Because if you're on the highest point and it drops away from either side of you, you're definitely on a ridge. So uh, in this case, if I was climbing up Mount Meeker along its, you know, southeast ridge here, and I wasn't sure where I was on the ridge, but I knew I was there somewhere, that would right away tell me I'm somewhere along this line. Um, in this example, um, uh, though, I'm going to dig into option two here. So option two is when... Uh, 
you don't have something easy to use, uh, like a trail or a creek, a road, a ridge. Uh, in this case, you can draw what's called a transit. Uh, and this is essentially an imaginary line of sight between two objects, uh, between two landmarks. So let's say I'm hiking up to Chasm Lake in this example. You can see in this map here, up here. Um, I might know I'm on a trail, which it's hard to see here, but there's a trail on this map that kind of works its way up. Uh, and, and I might be standing right here on the map, and I don't know where I am, but I do know that looking north, I see Mount Lady Washington. I see this peak right here. And then I look south to me, and I can see this point, this peak, this unnamed point here uh, on, uh, on the side of Mount Meeker. So I am able to draw a transit because I know, right, that these two points are on either side of me. And so, and I, I know I can identify these two points on a map. And so as long as I can identify them on a map, I can draw that line between them. And I know I am somewhere on this line between these two mountains. Thankfully, in this case, I also know I'm on a trail that goes this way. So that would be all I need to do to find where these two lines intersect and immediately know, okay, I'm on the trail right around here because that's where the two lines intersect. Um, it's important to remember that not all lines of position are straight. You know, if you're doing one like this, or you're doing a ridge line, they might be straight. However, if you're doing a, a creek, if you're walking along a creek that is very curvy, you know, it could it could very well be, you know, a very curvy line of position. Um, the key is again to be able to find that second line of position that crosses where you are. That's that's going to be the key to pinpointing your location. Um, this is another thing that you can practice doing just out on the trail uh, as you're hiking along. Uh, you know, be wary of when you're passing between two different landmarks. You know, maybe it's uh, a little patch of trees that exists above tree line in, in, in one direction, and then you can see there's a, a pond or a lake directly the other direction. That would be another good example of, of two landmarks you could draw. Um, as you get better, you'll be able to draw on finer and finer details and smaller and smaller landmarks to find you know, more lines of position more easily. But again, the best practice for this is doing it, heading out there, trying to identify your position and the terrain on the map in the field, and then using those, those landmarks to really figure out where you are and repeating it all the time. Um, this is the, the, the best way to become a good navigator. All right, so we are now going to dig in to navigating with a compass. Um, I, like I said, a map is, is really all you need to navigate in about 95% of, of, of you know, situations. You'll be able to find your own position uh, using lines of position or landmarks. Uh, and, and based on that, you know, know where you are on the route and then know use a terrain association to know where you should go based on what the map is showing. However, there are two big situations where, you know, a compass can help you navigate as well. Um, and these are one, when you're traveling off trail. And so you've got a lot, uh, a lot less obvious landmarks to, to um, guide you. And then also low or no visibility situations. Um, so, you know, getting stuck in the fog, getting stuck in the snow, uh, getting stuck outdoors at night when there is no moon. These are all good situations for using a compass. Um, a, a important point to mention when using a compass, especially if you've never used one before, uh, is the issue of declination. Essentially, a compass points to magnetic north, uh, but magnetic north, which is like the, the north spot in the magnetic field of the Earth, it is not actually true north. There is a slight difference between these two points. And depending where you are on the planet, that difference changes. Um, I grew up in Wisconsin, uh, which just uh, happens to line up so that magnetic north and true north are essentially the same thing. Uh, they, they're essentially, you know, one is behind the other compared to Wisconsin, which means you don't have to account for anything. So this is something I never had to deal with growing up until now. Um, in other places, you actually have to adjust your compass slightly so that you don't end up three or four degrees off where you're headed. Um, the easiest way to do this is using a USGS map because they all include uh, declination information, which looks like this on the right here, the symbol uh, at the very bottom of the map. And it's pretty simple. All you have to do is place your compass over this symbol and turn the little uh, uh, compass bezel, which is essentially the, the circular piece that you can turn that has all of the various um, number readings around it. Um, you simply turn it to align 
the magnetic north with the north in your compass. So it's it's literally just adjusting it a couple of degrees so that it fits. Um, you should do this once, ideally when you're still at home. Uh, that way, if you're having difficulties with it, you can jump on online, look up a YouTube video, uh, because some compasses do this differently. Some involve actually changing it on the back using a little key, um, whereas others you just adjust the actual circular base plate on the front. So um, you can check with, you know, wh when you buy a compass, you can look up for that specific brand, um, how you adjust the declination. Um, but if you're only going to be using it in Colorado, you can just do this declination once. And it should be good for the future uh, unless you're traveling to a different place. Now, once you've declinated, the biggest skill that you need to know for using a compass is what we call boxing the needle, uh, which is really just a fancy way of saying turning yourself and, and adjusting your direction until you get this magnetic meat needle here. This is the, the needle that spins around right uh, to face north. You want that to align with this orienteering arrow, which is essentially painted onto the bottom of the compass. And so um, that's gonna come in handy, boxing the needle uh, for multiple other things you use a compass for. So it's a good skill to master. Um, once again, you're just gonna use the compass um, and, and move it, move around until you get this floating magnetic needle to be directly over the orienting mirror needle. So they you know, align. Um, this is something you can use to double check your orienteering uh, when you're trying to orient your map and make sure your map is facing north. So I, I wouldn't rely on the compass as the first step because, again, this is how you practice by first finding, uh, finding landmarks and trying to orient it that way. However, once you think you have it right, then it's a good idea to take out your compass and lie it so that, uh, you know, north, the orienteering arrow is pointing north. And then you, all you have to do, again, is box the arrow. And if you had it correct, the, the arrow should already be boxed, you know, when you place it down. It should already be, you know, the arrow on the, the base plate and the actual magnetic north should be aligning. That shows that your map is pointing in the right direction. Now, compass bearings refer to all of these little numbers that uh, are around the uh, compass housing. And they range from zero all the way up to 360. Um, and compass bearings can be a little complicated. So uh, I should say in advance that, you know, today is just an introduction. Uh, if these are skills you want to uh, master, it really does take practice. Um, so hopefully this excites you and inspires you to, you know, get a compass uh, and, and take it out with you and start practicing some of these skills because they will take some time uh, and effort to master. So a compass bearing is used essentially to give you uh, or to take a very specific direction, uh, to take note and to maintain that direction. Um, each degree points to a specific direction, you know, around you. Um, we take that that whole circle of, of direction around you and we, we cut it up into 360 unique spots, essentially. And so you can imagine that gives you a great degree of specificity in terms of, of following a specific direction. This really isn't necessary if you are following a trail, uh, because again, as long as you are on the trail, you don't need a bearing to follow. However, if you're off trail traveling, or if you get into a situation, a situation where there's low visibility and you you can't you can't just go based on you know sight alone, that's where a bearing makes all the difference. So there's two ways to take a bearing, which essentially means to figure out what direction you need to go. Um, you can do this first by looking at the terrain itself, right? Uh, if I know that I need to get to a base of a mountain and I can see that spot in the distance, I can simply point the base plate of the arrow. Specifically, there's going to be this direction of travel arrow. I'm going to point that at the thing I want to be headed towards, literally the direction of travel, right? And then I'm going to just rotate, again, this little bearing that has all these numbers around, and I'm going to do that to box the arrow. See how boxing the arrow comes up a lot? And once I have that orienteering arrow and the magnetic needle aligned, whatever number shows up at the index line, that is the bearing. In this case, it would be about 300, I believe, if we turn it. Um, that degree number, so let's pretend it's 300 degrees, that is the direction I would need to head to reach that mountain. And so, for example, if I was going to be heading through a thick forest, and I knew I needed to pop out the other side at the base of that mountain, 
and I'm not sure I can see the mountain, you know, from within the forest. So I could get way off track. You might want to take a bearing of, of where that mountain is and then keep it on your compass, right? As long as you have, you don't turn the dial again, you'll be able to continue following it through the forest. So you pop out of the other side directly where you should be. Um, that is that is sort of the power that comes from taking a terrain bearing. Uh, you can do this as well on a map as long as you know where your location is. Uh, if you don't know where your location is, you may need to to draw a few lines of position. Um, you know, using the skills we just mentioned to uh, to fix your position. Uh, and once you have a position fix, you can then pull out your compass. Um, you line up this base plate, essentially pointing at the destination you're trying to get to from where you are. Um, and then once again, you're going to turn that dial um, so that the the arrows match between the magnetic arrow and the orienteering arrow. And once again, the bearing is going to be showing up right here at the index line. So uh, you can do it from a map. You can do it from terrain. Um, either way, it will give you essentially the number to keep on your compass to follow to get you in a straight line as the curl flies to that location. Once you have a bearing, again, you can follow it. And this is pretty simple, right? Um, first of all, write down the bearing. Write on your map is my my suggestion so you don't forget it uh, because that's a pain and you have to you know, either backtrack or re, uh, recalculate that bearing. And then you're gonna hold out the, uh, the, the um, uh, compass in front of you and you're gonna turn the, the, the dial so that your bearing number is what is in the direction of the travel arrow. Um, and then you're going to follow that direction of travel arrow. So it's pretty simple. Once you have that number, it's as simple as lining up the number with the, the, the front arrow and then heading that direction. Um, the really powerful thing that comes from compass skills, though, is that uh, once you, you know how to take a bearing and actually draw it on the map like that, you can use it to identify your location. So specifically, uh, let's say that there are three points, um, and this this drawing example is is using a boat, but same same thing applies for you know um, on land situations. Um, if I'm able to identify three landmarks, let's say one of them is a lake and two of them are some large peaks, I can sit down on a map, line up the compass with each of the three points, um, draw those lines, get the bearings, and where the three lines uh, interact. That's going to be, generally speaking, uh, where I am. Uh, in some cases, you may not get a perfect point, like in this example. You may actually end up with a small triangle created, and uh, you know that you are somewhere within those three triangles. Uh, people take two bearings rather than three, because or three bearings rather than two, excuse me, uh, because it provides a lot more detail uh, and increases the accuracy. So um, using a compass, to take bearings to locate yourself. Uh, this takes practice to do. Uh, again, I don't expect uh, you to be able to do it on your own just after watching this uh, this presentation. So if this is something you want to master, like I said, get a compass uh, and, and try doing this next time you're out in the woods. Um, it'll take a few minutes to, to try your first time. Um, however, it should be easy to do after um, you know a few times out there practicing. A few notes on when to use these bearings because I, I keep saying that they, you know, a map normally is all you need. Um, these are some examples of when you might get the compass out to take some bearings. Um, I, I think I already said the first one. You know, if you are in a situation where you can see uh, the landmark you're heading towards, but you're going to lose sight of it for a while, maybe you're going to head down into a canyon, you're going to go into a forest, um, but you're going to lose sight. That's a great example of where you can take that bearing beforehand so that once you're you know, in the thick of it, so to speak, you can just look down at your compass and know, yes, that way is the mountain, even if I can't see it. Another good example is if you're hiking down a mountain and you get enveloped by a snowstorm. Um, this picture right here is from Mount Yale um, in September. So not late in the season by any means. Uh, and as you can see, I had visibility of maybe 20 feet ahead of me. Um, this is another good example where even if you're pretty sure you're on trail, it's probably a good idea to pause, take take a bearing reading, and make sure, you know, based on your map, since I obviously can't see a landmark in this situation, uh, and keep that on you so that you know you're heading in the right direction. And if you go off route, you notice it because you're suddenly heading in the opposite direction of what your compass says you should be going. A third example is, you know, if you get delayed until nightfall, 
uh, and you no longer can make out landmarks because it's too dark. Um, this can be especially a problem uh, on moonless nights. Um, this is another time when just pausing to take a bearing uh, using your map would be a great idea. There's a lot of other things you can do with a compass. Um, however, those simple skills are going to get you through about 90% of the situations where you need one. So uh, definitely recommend taking some time to practice with those. Um, I'm running a little bit over tonight, so I'm going to kind of zoom through these last sections. Uh, but if people have questions, we'll have lots of time still for Q&A. So no worries on that. Uh, using a GPS tool um, is a little bit of a controversial thing, in my opinion. Um, it's relatively simple in terms of the nuts and bolts, right? You know, um, the key things to remember is that uh, you do need to download any relevant maps or routes before you go. Um, sometimes people assume that, you know, um, if they look up on Google Maps, for example, the, the route, um, that it'll still be there when they're in the mountains. And oftentimes that's not the case. Often a route is, uh, is gonna come from cell service, you know, the little line to follow. Uh, whereas the map itself and your location on it comes from GPS. And so you might still have the map and your location, but you might not actually have the trail uh, because that is data you know, coming from a cell tower and you lose that in the mountains. So make sure you download that sort of information before you get out to the mountains. Uh, but once you're there, it's as simple as turning on your GPS, um, getting a position, which essentially requires as much open sky as possible, um, and then being able to, to locate yourself just by looking right on the map, uh, it'll show you. Um, these maps also automatically orient themselves so that north is, is facing the right direction. And as you turn, you know, you'll see your direction turn as well in real time. So it's, it really couldn't be simpler. So you might be wondering, well, why not just always use a GPS? If it's so simple, why do I need to, you know, have these map and compass skills at all? Well, as this slide very clearly states, uh, you know, GPS is just frankly not a replacement for a map and compass. Uh, in my opinion, the biggest problem is that, again, these studies show that if you are consistently just using a GPS, you know, if you're not making any effort to look out at the terrain around you, look at the terrain on the map and then make some deductions, if you're just looking at, okay, there I am on the map, period, you are losing those skills every time you do that, um, those terrain association skills, which means when you're navigating through nasty class three terrain, we're like, you have to be within five to 10 feet of the exact route or else the route gets very dangerous. It, you need that level of detail. It's not enough to just look at a GPS map on a peak like Long's, Long's Peak or uh, a class four peak. You need to be able to look around you in real time and make those terrain association um, insights. So I recommend using GPS as little as possible. Ideally, you should head out there and if you have it in your pack for emergencies, Ideally, never take it out unless you actually come across an emergency. Uh, your goal should be to, as consistently as possible, navigate just using your map and just using your compass, uh, because that's going to grow your skills uh, so quickly that you find you don't even need the GPS because you're able to navigate just fine without it. Lastly, um, all of this is intended to keep you from getting lost. Obviously, uh, that is the goal we all have. But even in the best of situations where you do everything right, it is still possible to make a mistake and end up lost. So uh, I did want to cover a couple of recommendations if this happens to you. So first, you know, when do you actually know you're lost, right? You know, how much should you try to get back on route versus just kind of staying put and calling it quits? Um, first thing to keep in mind is that getting off route is pretty actually common. Um, and so if you do find that you're off route, whether you look at a map and you just realize I'm here and the route's over here, or things just don't look right, you know, um, regardless of how you realize it, um, the first thing is to stop because you're only going to get yourself more lost um, and take some time to try to figure out where you actually are. Again, you can use those lines of position to, to uh, sort of reduce uncertainty and figure out where you might be. Uh, you can use a compass to take some bearings uh, on a few other locations, and that will pinpoint your location. And in a worst case situation, you might pull out your GPS uh, to verify what the other things have shown you. Um, if you do that right, you should be able to draw a line of where you came and simply backtrack and get back on route uh, pretty quickly. The issue is that if you try and you fail to get back on route, at least spending one or two hours to do so, and you still can't seem to find it, 
that is sort of the like the black line you've crossed where you should consider yourself lost. Um, at this point, it is a bad idea to keep moving because you may have already moved one to two hours further into the forest. You know, the last thing you want to do is keep moving in the wrong direction. So once you've tried and failed to get off uh, or back onto the route, this is when you should consider calling for help if you need it. Um, some tips for calling for help. Uh, if you need a signal for your cell or for your uh, personal locator beacon, uh, I recommend climbing to a nearby ridge or high point. Ideally, your map should help you navigate to the nearest one because it'll give you the best chance for getting a signal. Um, if you don't have a signal at this location still, you might try sending a text to 911 uh, because those call centers will accept texts and they require less of a signal to send. Before you actually make the call though, take a few minutes to practice what you're gonna say before you do, uh, because you may only have you know 20 seconds of connection before you lose the signal uh, for whatever reason. You may also have very limited battery at this point. So think through the five W's of who, what, where, when, why, um, you know, who's there, where are you, why do you need help, um, what is happening, uh, et cetera. Um, if you can answer these details really quickly for the dispatcher, that'll ensure they can get to you even if the call is dropped really quickly. And then probably most important here is, is once you've gotten through to search and rescue, stay put. Even if you're unsure for a fact whether or not they're coming, uh, even if there's weather on the way, stay put. Don't try to find your way out unless it is absolutely necessary for your safety. You know, if there's a forest fire headed your direction, sure, okay, go ahead, move. But there are very few situations where it's necessary to move before search and rescue comes. <laughs> Lastly, you really just need to focus on, on staying warm uh, and staying safe while awaiting rescue. Typically, a search and rescue in Colorado will get to you, and I say this typically because obviously there are exceptions, but in most cases, they'll get to you within 24, uh, 24 hours, which means food and water isn't a huge concern. Um, however, in some cases, it can be, especially in cases where you're stuck out there and search and rescue doesn't know where you are, or worse, they don't even know you're missing, right? That's sort of a worst case situation. Um, so if you are out there for a while, water and warmth are your two biggest concerns. You can make it for two weeks without food. So you don't really need to be hunting caribou, you know, if you've been out there for two days. Um, the key is really to, to build a fire if you can and get out of the wind uh, and stay in an emergency shelter if you brought one or in any extra layers you have uh, to stay warm. And if you need water, if you find yourself running out, um, do not move far. You know, if you're near a creek, if you're near a water source, you know, that's a good idea to get more water. Um, but if you need to travel to get it, return back to where you were. Hopefully you've still got a map with you so you can do that navigation. Because again, you want to be in the same place you were so the search and rescue can find you. Lastly, uh, this is not a time for modesty. You know, you want to be loud and visible. So if you have any brightly colored clothing or gear that you can lay out, put up in a tree above you, that is a great idea so that aircraft can see it. Um, Making a fire that is smoky is a good idea, and you can do that by by adding pine needles or wet uh, leaves from time to time. They'll create more smoke uh, than dry wood will. Uh, and also just blowing a whistle or yelling from time to time uh, is, a, is very helpful for search and rescue, especially when they're getting close and they're trying to sort of zero in on your position. Um, but these are all tips that'll help you get found a little bit faster and ideally stay safe. With that, I am going to open it up to any questions you all have, anything I didn't answer about um, using a map, using a compass, using GPS, what to do if you get lost, uh, route finding. Uh, if you have any questions here, go ahead and throw it in the, uh, the Q&A box right now. Um, I'll hang around here for a couple of minutes um, to answer them. But we'll see if anybody has any other questions. I didn't say specifically on where to uh, where to purchase some of these things, especially like a GPS and compass. But I will say that I have had great experiences at REI, especially with their GPS tools, uh, because they have all of the devices out on a table, um, you know, all day on. So you can actually go and you know play around with it, uh, see if it it syncs with your phone, if that's a feature you're looking for, um, and walk through that with a guide face-to-face. -face. Um, it's very helpful when you're going to be spending hundreds of dollars on one item um, to be able to sort of take it out for a test drive, 
you know, before you go through the pain of, of buying the whole thing. Um, plus REI has a, you know, no questions asked money back policy. Um, I believe it is limited on electronic devices like this for, I, I want to say 60 to 90 days, but that should still be more than, you know, more than enough to, uh, uh, to figure out if it works for you. Um, Lillian just asked, is it possible to tell if a, a peak is class two or three based on the topography without checking reports? Um, that's a good question. So that I think is it, it comes down to the, the type of map you're using uh, and the specificity and detail it has. Um, most USGS, USGS maps are, um, I believe the, the scale they use is one uh, to 24,000, which means, um, you know, one inch on the map is 24,000 inches in real life. And you can imagine that that means um, that there's a lot of detail missing in a map, right? Like if you're trying to capture 24,000 inches of detail in the real world in only one inch on a map, you just can't get that much, you know, topography in there. And essentially that means that you know, if there's a single class three spot on a route or even just a, a couple of tough climbing spots, you're not going to be able to see those cliffs because they're just too small. You know, you're going to see a hundred foot cliff because the contour lines are so far apart. Uh, but you might look at a map and there might be a 20 foot cliff there that doesn't show up because the, the contour lines aren't close enough together. So um, typically I would say it is not possible to tell just purely looking at a map. Um, and someone just asked, what does that class, what does class mean? Uh, class refers to the climbing difficulty of the mountain. So class one is, uh, is just hiking along a trail. Class two is like very easy scrambling where you might have to use your hands from time to time just to balance yourself. Class three, uh, is going to be simple, very simple climbing where you might be using both hands, but really just for balance. Class four is like climbing but essentially where you don't need a rope so you're pulling yourself up with your hands uh and a fall could be fatal but typically you don't need a rope and then lastly uh class five is for actual technical rope climbing like you might do at a climbing gym so um yeah typically i would always read the trip report because the way class ratings work i should mention too is that it's based on the hardest spot on the trail right so even if there's only a single class three move and it's really, really tiny, like so tiny that it would never show up on the map, um, that's still gonna be considered class three rather than class two. Um, somebody asked, um, uh, thank you for the compliments. <laughs> uh, somebody asked, can I walk you through how to measure distance between one point and another based on the map? Sure, uh, great question. I actually should have added that. So thank you for pointing that out. Um, there's two ways to measure distance, and it depends on what your purpose is. If you just want to measure the distance in terms of, you know, as the crow flies, like if you see a mountain ahead of you and you're like, I wonder how far away that mountain is, the easiest way is to use on most compasses that we looked at in this presentation along the base plate. You, you probably noticed they actually have a ruler built in. And so you can hold that ruler up and just simply measure, you know, from where you are on the map to the point. And then again, the, the scale of the map should be listed at the bottom um, it, on USGS maps. It'll say like, for example, one to 24,000, which means one foot on the map is 24,000 feet in real life. And then it's just a matter of, of multiplying. You know, if I measured it was 32 inches and it's a one to 24,000 uh, scale map, then I would times the, the inches by 24,000 and do a little bit of, you know, um, translation into miles or, or feet, and that'll give me a pretty good idea of how far away that mountain is. If you uh, if you are trying to find the distance actually along the trail, um, I like doing this with either um, shoelace. I always carry extra shoelaces with me when I'm hiking, so I always have one in my bag. Um, and it's, it's rudimentary, but it works well, is to simply lay that shoelace out along the trail and, and catch all the curves and switchbacks and things like that, right? Because a lot of the worst trails have lots of if curves in them. Um, and then, you know, mark where the end of, of the spot is on that, uh, on that rope. You can also, also use rope. You could use paracord, anything like that. Um, and then you're going to take that rope you just used to measure it and just lay it out and measure that length straight, at, you know, straightened out using your compass edge. Um, and that'll account for all of the squiggles and turns and twists and give you um, 
to a reasonable accuracy, uh, an idea of how far you have to go. Um, I think that is a probably the best method for, you know, for example, measuring how much further you have to go along a hike. Um, I have tried to use my GPS before to try to keep track of that, of how far I'm moving. Uh, and honestly, the GPS is just not accurate enough in many mountainous cases to be able to accurately see how far you've gone and how far you have to go. Um, last time we tried to do that, it actually led us to make a lot of poor decisions when, you know, trying to figure out how far we could go in a day uh, that resulted in like a 14 hour day of hiking because, you know, we had to, to get where we, need, we needed to go. So um, definitely recommend using the, um, the shoelace method for, for measuring distances for sure. Well, before we wrap up, I have one last thing here to share uh, before you go. Um, you know, I want to thank everyone for attending today. Um, and I also want to thank the people who make this possible because uh, I started the next summit a couple of years ago purely as a, you know, as a hobby, honestly. Um, you know, I, I was climbing on Long's Peak, um, watching people hike into a, a thunderstorm above me, sort of jaw dropped, just in shock that people did not know some of these sort of cornerstone safety rules when it comes to 14ers. And so um, that night I literally came home and I started, uh, started the next summit, um, started blogging because I wanted to create, uh, create more resources, free, accessible for people to use um, to learn these skills, you know, first aid, navigation, route finding, first aid, um, the things that you don't necessarily learn just by checking out a route online, right? You might, see a map, but it doesn't tell you how to read the map. Um, and that's really what I'm trying to do here. So uh, I, I wanted to thank the, you know, 75 different people who who support our work. Some people give every month, some people have just made a one-time gift. Uh, but I, I do ask if, if you learn something today uh, and you think it's gonna help you stay safe in the future, um, consider passing it forward by becoming a patron of, of the next summit. Um, not only do you, you help support a great cause and support mountain safety, uh, leave no trace education, you also get my uh, monthly newsletter that I share only with my uh, subscribers that has extra articles that I'm reading, tips, advice, uh, you know, special camping spots that are my favorites, um, different things just to show my appreciation. So um, you can learn more just by visiting the website, uh, thenextsummit.com, and right in the, the top of the menu bar, you'll see support the site and you can click support the site and see different options for giving back. So um, no worries if you're not in a place to uh, to support us, but uh, for those that are, I really do appreciate it. So um, we're gonna have a couple more webinars later this fall yet. We have one next month uh, specifically about climbing 14ers in shoulder season. Uh, that is essentially climbing in September and October uh, and November when the weather can be quite variable. Uh, so we'll go over what you need to know for that. Uh, we'll also be doing one later on in fall about winter conditions one about snow climbing, uh, one about leave no trace and some others. So definitely keep your eyes open uh, for my newsletter uh, to, to be able to sign up for those uh, when they come up as well. So um, thanks everybody for coming. Thanks for hanging around a little bit extra. I, I realize I went over, uh, but I hope this was helpful to everyone. So um, I hope everyone has a good rest of your Tuesday and hopefully we'll see you back here for one of our webinars in the future. So thank you all again. Have a great rest of your night and uh, safe travels on the trails.